Chemistry instructor Karen Frindell Tushar. So each panelist will present their talk, and then we're going to reserve some time at the end for questions from the audience. So without further ado, we're going to get started with Joe Kelly Moore. I always liked Watson better. I don't really know why. But what I brought you today was about eight minutes of film, which is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And he's talking about Watson, as well as Holmes, and also transcendentalism, which is something he was real interested in. I don't know how much you know about um, Doyle, but he wrote some very interesting science fiction books, as well as all these Holmes stories. And uh, one of the things he's gonna talk about in here is a man named Dr. Bell. I don't know if you guys have heard about Dr. Bell. When Doyle was a medical student, he met probably the first forensic scientist in a man named Dr. Bell when he was in med school. There was a film made about this. It's, there's two of them, actually. One is called The Murder Rooms, and the other is called Bell and Doyle. And it's, uh, it's uh, Doyle is a young man meeting this guy and uh, learning how to go about using deductive methods uh, to solve crimes. And, that's where, and this was a real person that he actually knew and actually influenced him. So, I'm not gonna talk a whole lot, I'm gonna show you things. I'm gonna show you this uh, little piece about Doyle talking and then two very brief scenes from two different Sherlock Holmes which have two different views of Watson. One thing to know about this piece of film is that it was made in the first half of the 20th century and so it moves really slow. Uh, as contemporary people, you're, you're used to having the whole story told in the first five minutes and what you're gonna see is do I wander up with his dog and start casually talking about something? So without running on too much longer, let's just look at this. Right there. psychic experiences and to take so much interest in that question. Well, first of all, about the Sherlock Holmes stories, they came about in this way. I was quite a, a young doctor at the time. I had, of course, a scientific training. And uh, I used occasionally to read detective stories. But what annoyed me, how in the old-fashioned detective story, they, Detective always seemed to get at his results, either by some sort of lucky chance or a fluke, or else it was quite unexplained how he got there. He got there, but he never gave an explanation how. Well, that didn't seem to me quite playing the game. It seemed to me that he's bound to give his reasons why he came to his conclusions. Well, once I began to think about this, I began to think of turning scientific methods, as it were, onto the work of detection. And I used, as a student, uh, to have an old professor, his name was Bell, who was extraordinarily quick at deductive work. He would look at the patient, he would hardly allow the patient to open his mouth, but he would make his diagnosis of the disease, and also very often of the patient's nationality and occupation and other points entirely by his part of observation. So naturally I thought to myself, well, if a scientific man like Bell was to come into the detective business, he wouldn't do these things by chance. He'd get the thing by building it up, 
scientifically. So, having once conceived that line of thought, uh, you can well imagine that I had, as it were, a new idea of the detective and one which it interested me to work out. I thought of a hundred little dodges, as you may say, a hundred little touches by which he could build up his conclusions, and then I began to write stories on those lines. At first, I think they attracted a little, very little attention, but after time, when I began the short adventures, one after the other, coming out month after month in the Strand magazine, uh, people began to recognize that it was different to the old detective, that there was something there uh, which was new. They began to buy the magazine, and uh, it uh, prospered, and so I may say did I. We both came along together, and uh, from that time, Sherlock Holmes fairly took root. I've written a good deal more about him than I ever intended to do, but my hand has been rather forced by kind friends who continually wanted to know more. And so it is that this monstrous growth <laughs> has come out out of what was really a, a comparatively small seed. But the curious thing is how many people around the world are perfectly convinced that he is a living human being. I get letters addressed to him. I get letters asking for his autograph. Get letters addressed to his rather stupid friend, Watson. I've even had ladies writing to say that they'd be very glad to act as his housekeeper. One of them, when she heard that he had turned to the occupation of keeping bees, wrote saying that she was an expert at <coughs> segregating the queen, whatever that may mean, <laughs> and that she was evidently predestined to be the housekeeper of Sherlock Holmes. I don't know if there's anything more I can say with advantage about him. But on the other point, which is to me, of course, a uh, very much more serious one, right? on the question of my taking up this psychic matter, curiously enough, my first experiences in that direction were just about the time when uh, Sherlock Holmes was being built up in my mind. That would be about the year 1886 and 1887. So nobody can say that I formed my opinions on psychic matters uh, very hastily. It's just 41 years now since I wrote a signed article upon the subject, which appeared in a magazine called Light, so that I put myself on record. During these 41 years, I never lost any opportunity of reading, of studying, and of experimenting on this matter. People ask me, will I write any more Sherlock Holmes stories? I, I certainly don't think it's at all probable. But as I grow older, the psychic uh, subject always grows in intensity and one becomes more earnest upon it and I should think that my few remaining years will probably be devoted much more in that direction than in the direction of literature. Nonetheless, of course, I haven't abandoned writing. One has to earn one's living. I'm going to stop this now. And the next thing I want to show you is uh, the Basil Rathbone homes because I think you'll find how do I get this on? Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> old lady with technology. Because I think you'll find that the Basil Rathbone Holmes looks, an, uh, the, the Watson looks an awful lot like Conan Doyle and almost sounds like him. And these were some of, not the very earliest, but some of the earliest films made. And I think you'll see uh, the resonance and the same sort of personality in Watson that you see in Conan Doyle in, the, in this little talk. So let's see if I can get this to work. This is just a very brief s part of a scene from The Hound of the Baskervilles, about three minutes or something. Oh, no, sir, he just left it by mistake, I imagine. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Dr. Mortimer. He didn't leave his name, sir. No, it's here on the stick, Mrs. Hudson. Oh, is it? I didn't notice. Do you know any Dr. Mortimer, Watson? No. Huh? What did he want? He didn't say, sir. What do you make of it, Watson? Why should I make anything of it? The fellow came to see you. Ah, but what kind of a fellow? Let me hear you reconstruct him from his walking stick by our usual method of elementary observation. Well, I should say that Dr. Mortimer is a successful man. Well esteemed. Good. Excellent. I should say that he does a great deal of his visiting on foot because the iron peril is, is worn down. Perfect. Is now. Let's have a look at this inscription. From his friends of the CCH. CCH. I should say that's for something or other hunt. Really, Watson, you've excelled yourself. <laughs> Has anything escaped me? Almost everything, my dear fellow. Huh? A present to a doctor, I'd say, is more likely to come from a hospital than a hunt. And when the letters CC are placed before the hospital, the name Charing Cross Hospital rather obviously presents itself. Oh, well, you, you may be right. Furthermore, I'd say that Dr. Mortimer had a small practice in the country and was the owner of a dog. How can you tell that? Quite simple. From the teeth marks. Look, you can see for yourself. A rather large dog, I'd say. And unless I'm mistaken, Dr. Mortimer will call on us again in a few moments. Rubbish, Holmes. Rubbish. How the devil can you deduce that? Well, as he left his stick, isn't it reasonable to presume that he'll come back and get it? Dr. Mortimer, sir. Mr. Holmes. Uh, yes, come in, Doc. So I think you can see the comparison between Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Watson in this. And also, since it was so um, close to the time that Doyle, uh, Doyle was alive and writing, it's not surprising that the character would um, be so much like him. But then when you look at the Jeremy Brett version, I have a little scene from Wisteria Lodge, you get that same uh, relationship between Holmes and Watson, but also um, a little bit different Watson. So let's look at this. How do you find the word grotesque? Grotesque? Oh, strange? Remarkable? No, 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 surely. There's more to it than that. Some underlying suggestion of the tragic, the terrible. If you cast your mind back to those narratives with which you've inflicted a long, suffering public, you'll see how often the word grotesque has deepened into the criminal. <laughs> I suppose that fair, the red-headed men was grotesque enough at the outset. Huh? Ah, all right. Most grotesque affair. The five orange pips. Yes, we go straight to a murderous conspiracy. Another word. Puts me on the alert. Oh, how about you, there? Hmm. I've just had the most incredible and grotesque experience. May I consult you, Scott Eccles? Post office, Charing Cross. Oh. A man or woman? Oh, man! Send a reply paid telegram, she would have come. Did you see him? Oh, my dear Watson. You know how bored I've been since we locked up Colonel Carruthers. Life is complex. The newspapers are sterile. Audacity of a man seemed to have passed forever from the criminal world. Of course I'll see him. But as I've very much mistaken, this is our client. Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Well, are you, Mr. Holmes? Certainly. Yes, Mr. Holmes, I have just had a most singular and unpleasant... Grotesque experience. Okay, so they, they say about writers that they write about themselves. That all stories come from inside you, and so you're really writing about yourself. And so I conclude myself that, of course, Doyle is both Holmes and Watson. Thank you. Where's the X? Well, do I want to close all tabs? Okay. <laughs> Ominous. Hello, everyone. Here, let's turn the lights on. I don't need to close there. There we go. 
Okay, so my name is Michael Aparicio. I teach in philosophy. And so what I'm here to talk about is as a philosophy teacher, when I encounter Sherlock Holmes examples, what is it that kind of strikes me about them? Now as a philosophy teacher, there are lots of different things that we, we teach. Uh, depends on the philosophy class that you take. But uh, one philosophy class that I suspect most people who are students here will take at one point or another is critical thinking. And that's definitely a class that I associate with Sherlock Holmes. So what I want to talk about today, for about six minutes or so, is just what are the ways in which Sherlock Holmes seems to be an example of a critical thinker? I want to start with an example. So I'm going to read this. This is something you may have heard before. What I, what I did was I, I used a common uh, kind of uh, Holmes uh, example that you find on the net, and I altered it for my purposes, so don't tell anyone if you, if you know the punchline. So Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are on a camping trip. After a nice hike, a good dinner, and a lot of wine, Watson goes to sleep. A few hours later, Holmes returns from a walk and wakes his faithful friend. Watson, look up. What do you see? His companion rubs his aching head, stares at the sky, and answers, lots of stars. What does that mean to you, Holmes asks. I don't know. I guess it means we'll have another sunny day tomorrow. I doubt it, Sherlock says. The moon is brighter than it was an hour ago, suggesting a low pressure has cleared out the dust, which means that rain is probably coming. Indeed, Holmes continues, I see clouds heading our way. Still rubbing his head, Dr. Watson asks, so what do the stars mean? Well, Sherlock Holmes concludes, among other things, our tent was stolen while I was walking. <laughs> now, I like this example. It's very succinct, and yet it is, I think, a very good illustration of some skills that are very commonly found in Sherlock Holmes. In one of the videos that we just saw, uh, the term that was used was elementary observation, but I'll get to that in a, in a moment. I'm going to use a different term for it. I just want to say that in, in a lot of ways, Sherlock Holmes is demonstrating critical thinking. Now, if you haven't taken critical thinking yet, you know, one, one way to think of it is in a critical thinking class, what you're trying to do is you're trying, the way I like to say it is you're trying to fine tune reasoning skills. You're trying to fine tune your ability to reach reliable conclusions given whatever the available evidence is. And there's lots of different skills that go into this. And I, I don't want to suggest that Sherlock Holmes uh, you know, ends up uh, uh, using all the skills. I think there are a handful of skills that he kind of repeats over and over again. Unfortunately, the term that's most often used when describing what he does is a term that makes philosophy teachers cringe. The term that's most often used, that Doyle used, is deduction. This is the term that you hear over and over again, that what Sherlock Holmes is doing is using deduction. And it makes philosophy teachers cringe because it is not deduction. It is induction. It is not deduction. It is induction. I don't want to spend a long time talking about the difference. I do think it's a distinction worth investigating. I encourage you to kind of look it up. What, what I will say for right now is with inductive reasoning, the point of inductive reasoning is that it's probabilistic reasoning. With inductive reasoning, the point of inductive reasoning is you're trying to look for evidence that makes your conclusion more and more likely. The, the more likely your conclusion is, then you know, the more probable it is, that's the stronger your argument is. Deductive, I don't want to get into the details, but deductive arguments work differently. This is a type, one type of inductive reasoning. That's what Sherlock Holmes is really known for. He's known for a type of inductive reasoning. Now, there's, there are a lot of different types of inductive arguments. You can, uh, you can try to find inductive evidence to support predictions. You can try to find inductive you know, evidence to support generalizations. 
You can try to find inductive arguments to, uh, to, to support causal claims. What Sherlock Holmes is especially good at, there isn't a single name for it. Uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, right around the time that, that, that Doyle was writing, the term that was often used is abduction. It's not a term that's commonly used anymore. If you look at critical thinking, I don't know of a critical thinking book that's out there now that uses the term abduction. That, that used to be the term for it. Um, and in, you know, in, in one video there, the term that was used was elementary observation. I'm not a, a Holmes scholar, but my understanding is that that you know that catchphrase is elementary. Uh, that that actually wasn't a common you know, catchphrase. But but be that as it may, that that's not a term that you that you'll find used. Some elementary observation. There's different terms that I'll encounter. My colleague Joel Rudenow, who's written a critical thinking book, in his textbook he calls it hypothetical reasoning. That's what he uses. He calls it. Hypothetical reasoning, which I think is a pretty good name for it because it has something to do with offering evidence to support hypotheses. Now, you want to be careful about this. I think for a lot of people, they get the wrong idea. It's, you know, so hypothetical reasoning is not the sort of thing that you do when playing Clue. When playing Clue, you know, especially in the beginning of the game, you're just guessing. You know, I mean, you're just like, oh, it's Colonel Mustard in the study with the, with the knife. And, and you're, you're guessing. It, you're, you're, it's a hypothesis in that sense of the word. Now, what I want to suggest is hypothetical reasoning is the type of argument you use when you're trying to justify one hypothesis over another. That's what Holmes seems especially good at. That's what, in my example that I use, that's what, that's what we see. And so there's one hypothesis, there's another hypothesis. And can you try to justify one hypothesis over another? That's what he's really good at. Now, the way you do this is through observation your use of observation. And this, of course, is what Sherlock Holmes is especially known for. I mean, one thing he's especially known for is actually making keen observations that other people don't notice. He notices a, you know, a hair that's not the same color as my hair on my jacket. He notices the shoes, or, oh, those are shoes that are made you know, and sold only in Prague. Or, you know, he, all these little observations that others don't notice. And that's important with hypothetical reasoning. Because if you notice all these observations, then you have more evidence to try to support one hypothesis over another. But that isn't enough. It isn't enough just to make keen observations. It isn't enough to just pile on the evidence. What I want to point out, and this was illustrated in the example I use, that there are kind of two ways of using observation. One, we saw this with the reference to the stars. There's different names that are used for this. If it's a critical thinking class, I'd go into the details about the names. But the basic idea is when Holmes asked Watson to look at the stars, you know, you know, he asked Watson what he thought of, you know, that you know, he could conclude from this. And he thought it was going to be another nice day. And the stars, the, w the word I'll use, is the stars confirmed that. They were consistent with that idea. And if that was the only observation we made, then you know, Holmes's, uh, Holmes's hypothesis would be just as good as, as Sherlock Holmes's. I'm sorry, Watson's would be just as good as Sherlock Holmes's. But then, of course, Sherlock Holmes made two additional observations. He noticed the moon was brighter now than it had been an hour ago. And he understood the significance of that. He understood that that made it more likely that it was going to rain soon. Something that he found further evidence for when he looked and saw the clouds coming. This was evidence 
that he used to then, the word I'll use is disconfirm. Evidence he used to kind of say, no, your hypothesis isn't likely. So there's different terms for this. In the sciences, often you'll hear falsifying evidence. I'll just say disconfirming evidence. And so what Holmes is really good at is, is, is noticing lots of things that others don't notice and then knowing what to do with it. And that's an important point. That's, that's a point that a philosophy teacher will really stress, knowing what to do with the observations once you make them. Noticing, oh, which hypotheses do these observations confirm? Which hypotheses do these observations help rule out or falsify or disconfirm? And the more you're able to do that, the more you're able to try to reach good hypotheses, the more you're able to demonstrate the very skills that I think help make Sherlock Holmes a good critical thinker. That's what I have to say. <laughs> so I'm going to talk from here so that I can be close to my experiments that I want to show you. Um, I'm Karen from Del Tusher. I teach chemistry here at Santa Rosa Beer College. And I am going to talk about Sherlock Holmes as a Victorian era forensic scientist. And although he wasn't a real character, I do think in my recent and somewhat limited experience with Sherlock Holmes that he introduced forensic science to the general public as a character in these stories. And uh, so I um, am going to talk a little bit about what I found in, in the novel that I read and then show you some uh, modern and even some old examples of some of the chemistry that uh, Sherlock Holmes would have done. So, you know, I was only, before I got asked by Lauren to do this talk, I was only really familiar with the popular culture, uh, Sherlock Holmes. Like, I know he has a special hat, I know he had a pipe, um, but I hadn't really read any of the novels. So I sat down and I read a study in Scarlet, which I think is the very first novel. And I was pretty much hooked from the very beginning uh, because I realized that it combines two of my favorite things in the world, uh, chemistry and murder stories. <laughs> so I have a secret advice. Um, I love a good murder story, true or not true. So um, I pretty much, I bought the anthology, so I'm going to read all the rest of them now. Um, and especially when they opened up the story, uh, when Watson first meets Sherlock Holmes, Sherlock Holmes is in his chemistry lab. And so I just wanted to read this passage uh, from the story, which if you read, I'm sure you're familiar, but it just kind of sucked me right in. Um, he was, Dr. Watson came in and Sherlock Holmes was uh, working out a new test to identify a substance as blood. This was a lofty chamber, lined and littered with countless bottles. Broad, low tables were scattered about, which bristled with retorts, test tubes, and little Bunsen lamps with their blue flickering flames. There was only one student in the room who was bending over a distant table absorbed in his work. At the sound of our steps, he glanced round and sprang to his feet with a cry of pleasure. I found it, I found it, he shouted to my companion, running towards us with the test tube in his hand. I found a reagent which is precipitated by hemoglobin and by nothing else. Had he discovered a gold mine, greater delight could not have shown upon his features. And I just loved that because I like chemistry that, that much too. <laughs> I like chemistry as much as Sherlock Holmes liked chemistry. Um, and so, so immediately at this point, he runs and gets a um, needle and he pricks his own finger to see if he has really done this test. And indeed, it, it precipitates. And then he quickly has to go put a, a Band-Aid on, basically. A plaster, they call it in the book. Uh, because he, and then he makes a comment how he's so often he's working with poisons that he just can't have any pin uh, pricks in his skin because the poisons might get in. So I thought that was pretty telling. Um, so the, the big question, you know, is something blood or is it not blood? And if you've watched a lot of CSI shows, you, you see that that's even a problem to this very day. Because when you, know, when you see fresh blood, you know it's blood pretty much. But if blood is on different kinds of surfaces, if it's been there for a long time, if it's been mixed with something else, you just can't tell. And there's a comment in the story about is it blood, is it mud, is it fruit? Is it rust? Is it, you know, what is this dark substance? And uh, back in the 19th century, they didn't have a lot of good tests for blood. They had one where you would try to scrape it off and look in a microscope and see if you could actually see the blood cells. But the problem is, is that those blood cells would kind of 
dissipate and not really be there by the, you know, if the, if the stain was more than a couple of hours old. And then there were other tests you could do where you could take the bark of some tree and mix it in with the blood and it, a specific reaction should occur, but it gave too many false positives. And so uh, Sherlock Holmes supposedly in this story had, had uncovered something that was a much more positive test for blood. And in fact, the tests that I am gonna show you for blood are not even as ideal as the one that he describes because they're what's called presumptive tests, um, which means you kind of have to already be pretty sure that it might be blood. Um, and then there are other things. So if it's negative, you can kind of think that it's not, but if it's positive, you have to have, you have, to have other information in order to know if it really is. Um, so I'm gonna show you a test that, um, I'm gonna show you two. We'll see how this goes. I've got a bunch of chemicals back here. I have my safety glasses. Um, the chemistry stockroom folks were nice enough to put this stuff together for me. So there's a, this test, the first one I'm gonna show you has been around since 1904. So it really is you know, something that they've been using since, the, uh, since of around the time of Sherlock Holmes. And it's called the phenolphthalein test. And so they've made me this giant Q-tip to, because that, if you watch the TV shows where they use this test, they sort of swab the stuff that they think is blood off of the surface. So to replicate that though, I'm just gonna, okay, oops, that's the wrong one, sorry, so sorry. They've numbered them and everything. So this orange stuff is, is a, I didn't wanna use real blood. So this is a solution containing iron. Yeah, I know, right? Um, this is a solution containing iron, which is a reasonable facsimile, because it's actually the iron in the blood that causes the chemical reaction. And so if you have found another stain that was dark like that, the likelihood of it containing iron and not being blood is small. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's, um, that's what causes the reaction. So you have to sort of uh, swab the blood off of the surface. <laughs> we'll see how this goes. And then you add the phenolphthalein reagent. This is a dye. It's, you're saying, how can it be a dye? It's clear. It has no color. This is a dye that has been reduced with, with zinc metal to a non-colored compound. And when it reacts with um, blood and hydrogen peroxide, that the blood reacts the hydrogen peroxide, which produces oxygen, which then should change the color of this dye to a purple color. So that's what they're doing on the CSI shows. I was so happy to find out, because I always wondered, how does this work? Oops, sorry, you do this one, and then you do, this is the dye that currently has no color. You can see it's still kind of a yellow, which is the color of the solution. And then when I put the hydrogen peroxide on, you can see. Now if it was real blood, I think it actually turns more of, this is supposedly purple, it looks a little brownish, but yeah, it's purple. So this is what a positive test for blood looks like. And they say that if it doesn't happen right away, it's not a positive test um, because 30 seconds later, it'll turn purple no matter what, um, so if there's blood in there. So that's something that, although it wasn't the perfect test that Sir Arthur Conan Doyle described, it's one that Sherlock Holmes could have maybe used in his story. The next one I'm gonna show you is definitely something that they use now, but it was not created until 1928. So it was kind of after the time. Um, this is a substance called luminol. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but it's kind of exciting when you see it. There may be a time when we want to turn off the lights. Um, this is the one that you see people spraying. If you, see, if you watch a lot of those shows, spraying the room, turning off the lights. So luminol is a dye whose glow is enhanced when it comes into contact with oxygen. And again, that oxygen is generated by iron from blood reacting with hydrogen peroxide. So they instructed me to just pour this all in here. So this was the luminol. And this is the hydrogen peroxide. And then I've got this iron ferry cyanide. Again, I didn't want to use real blood. So this is a red sort of powdery substance. I guess I should move my bottles out of the way. Do I look like Sherlock Holmes yet in his chemistry lab? <laughs> okay, you wanna get the lights. Isn't it beautiful? This is why I do chemistry in case anybody ever wants to know. So pretty, and actually they said to put it all in, but they said go slow because it 
it fizzes. What'd you say? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So pretty. Yeah, okay, you could turn the lights back on. It's still glowing a little bit, but uh, okay. So um, this test can also give a false positive when it comes into contact with certain things. Interestingly, one of those things is bleach. And I find that interesting because you might not be able to find blood in a crime scene, but if someone has cleaned their entire kitchen from floor to ceiling with bleach, it is also uh, suspicious. So it might, it, you know what I mean? So you might be able to find out something from that. Okay, so, so that was the first uh, type of thing that I found that Sherlock Holmes was interested in testing for. The second thing is poison. And so if you, if you read a study in Scarlet, there's, he comes upon this murdered guy in this abandoned house, and there's blood all over the place, but he soon realizes that the guy who's dead doesn't have any wounds on him. So he wasn't bleeding, and he said, of course, he has been poisoned. And, and then he's kind of thinking about that throughout the rest of the story, and eventually he comes upon some pills, and he goes, oh, well, there's the poison that I've been looking for. And I don't know if you recall, he didn't have a good test for poison, obviously, at that time, because in the story, he actually fed the pill to a dog. <laughs> it was a very old dog, though, that, that someone was going to put to sleep anyway. <laughs> I don't like stories where dogs die either, and my husband was very surprised that I didn't just throw the book away. But it was an old dog, and he gave the pill to the dog, and the dog, and the dog died, so he knew it was poison. But, but there are other tests for poisons, and I'm pretty confident that Sherlock Holmes has, has used those. And um, I read this book, and I wanted to share it with you because it's very fascinating. I didn't read the whole thing, but I used it as a reference. The Science of Sherlock Holmes by E.J. Wagner. And it has a lot of um, true crime from the Victorian era in it, and it talks about all the different types of forensic science that Sherlock Holmes does. And it talks about the different kinds of poisons that were around in that time. And arsenic was a classic one. Arsenic is just an elemental substance that you can get out of rocks and things like that. Um, and they also used animal poisons like snake venom to poison people, but, but Sherlock Holmes was primarily concerned with alkaloids. So I don't know if you've heard of alkaloids, but alkaloids are made uh, by plants, and they are chemically related compounds that, that are generally poisonous um, or somehow physiologically active. So for example, cocaine, nicotine, caffeine, those are all alkaloids. And uh, so, so he, this, this poison pill that he feeds to the dog, he suspects that it's an alkaloid. And so I wanted to do a simple test to show you uh, the presence of an alkaloid. And it's based on a metal called bismuth. And so you can actually make this reagent with um, Pepto-Bismol if you want to. We had the right bismuth substance in the lab. And actually, I just learned that right at this very moment, at the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry in Portland, there's a Sherlock Holmes, a science Sherlock Holmes exhibit there. And there is a woman who's doing some of the forensic science, and she's actually doing this exact demonstration. And so, that, so I've got some water. This is my control. And then I've got some quinine. So quinine is in tonic water. You might know that. And it's, a, it's actually not poisonous unless you eat a whole lot of it. But it is an alkaloid, and it's chemically related to all of those other toxic compounds. So I'm going to add this, once I fill these up here, I'm going to add this bismuth reagent. It's called Dragendorf's reagent, which is just a very cool sounding name, really. Made from bismuth and acetic acid. And I'll show you what a positive and negative test for poison looks like. Do we remember which one was the control? I think it was this one. Okay, good, all right. <laughs> so you can see it's kind of a reddish, but it's clear, a clear reddish solution. So in water, it just sort of colors the water, the same color as the, as the solution is. And when I put it with the quinine, very low concentration, the 83, parts per million. Um, and I think you can even, so it's, it can t detect these, the presence of these alkaloids in a very sort of sensitive way. So there you go. And so when he talked about the test where he was precipitating hemoglobin, this is a test where this, the reason it looks milky like this is because it's a precipitate. So it's formed a solid 
compound instead of just kind of basically dissolving in the liquid. And so that's a quick and simple way of knowing whether you have poison or not. Good idea to do before trying things. So that's really <laughs> sort of concludes my portion of the talk, but I did want to just quickly list off some of the things that Sherlock Holmes did that are kind of other forensic science CSI things. Um, in the story that I read, he did a lot with footprints. And so uh, Michael was talking about the shoes and knowing what kind of shoes. He could look at the footprints in the ground and, and say, this guy was wearing this kind of shoes and he walked and did this and he paced and then he left. And so he did footprints, but he also did tire tracks, which is something that you see on the forensic science shows. And he's talked about the cab. This had to be a, a cab and not a rich person's carriage because the tires were a certain um, width. Um, he also does, in some of his stories, I guess, handwriting analysis. He uses dogs to solve crimes. Um, he does things like can tell what typewriter typed a letter because every typewriter has something slightly wrong with it. And so he can trace uh, letters back to certain typewriters. And he even he uses insects to determine how long a body has been um, dead and analyzes dust and fibers also, like Michael had mentioned, and um, cigar ash. So he could know like what kind of cigar left certain piles of ash. So those are among the many things that have made me now a brand new lover of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> so thank you. So we have a few minutes for questions. I don't recall ever reading, there was a biography of uh, Conan Doyle, but I don't recall anything about that being in there. I would think Watson was much more of the person who would have, if there, of the two of the personality types, it would have leaned toward that rather than Holmes. So he was kind of a scientific kind of guy, probably didn't, you know, go for that stuff. My guess is that it was a, probably a very high fever, which lasted over time. It could have been meningitis, but my guess would be it, would, it was something like that. Because they didn't have the same kind of controls for that sort of stuff, that sort of thing that we have now, and it could kill you then. So if you got some something like a cold or the flu, Influenza. yeah. Yeah. We're not using the word hysteria because we all know what that where that comes from, right? <laughs> so yeah. Brain injury. Yeah. 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 There were a lot of euphemisms for yeah. syphilis back then, oh. so I don't know. <laughs> okay. I guess. Uh, so when, it, when I get an invitation like that, uh, usually I'm wildly ambivalent. It's like, wow, that's really cool, but oh, I really don't have the time. 
so there's that process, uh, and uh, but it just seemed too tempting to pass it up. By it's just you know I I actually had a, a, a graduate teacher uh, who wrote a logic class a logic textbook and he called it What If and he uh, kind of. You know, it wasn't based on the Sherlock Holmes stories, but he used Sherlock Holmes as a character in this book, and it's just something that was always in the back of my head. Uh, uh, and so I just kind of saw it as an opportunity to, to do something. And, you know, and, and then for, for me, I wanted to do what, what Karen said, and like, oh, go out and get the book and, and, and start reading, but I, I just didn't really have the time. And, and so, you know, what I did was just kind of based on, you know, what I, what I have read in my own discipline. Um, and, you know, and, and, you know, uh, kind of, there's kind of two rounds. There's early on, you, you, uh, you do a lot of research, and then at the last minute, you're kind of running around getting ready. <laughs> just like when students get ready for tests. <laughs> you want to go? Sure. Um, well, I looked at it as an opportunity to do something that I was kind of unfamiliar with. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things I did was I went and I looked at what other chemists had published about Sherlock Holmes. And it turns out that there's a lot of, like in the Journal of Chemical Education, for example, there are articles published on how to do Sherlock Holmes style tests in your students' labs and stuff. And then other people had done tributes to him. And that's where I started seeing these passages where they had quoted things that he did and said. And then I read, that. then I went and read the story and and saw that it was all kind of right there. And there, there are several of these books that people have written about the science of Sherlock Holmes. So I looked into those and I, and I chose this one, which I think I will now read in its entirety because I just, I just, like I said, I used it as a reference to find out. It's very well written. And a lot of books about science in popular culture are unfortunately, in my opinion, not very well written because they're written by scientists and not writers, if that makes any sense, not necessarily scientist writers. <laughs> This person seems like a really good writer and the way they, they tell stories of how real people in the, in the 19th century read the Sherlock Holmes stories and then some, even sometimes tried to replicate some of the crimes that were committed in those, in those stories. So I think my process is, is continuing because I'm going to read this book and then uh, read some more mystery murders over the uh, Christmas break, I think. <laughs> I uh, read these books when I was in my teens, all of them, all of the stories. And I've lo always loved Sherlock and, and particularly Watson. He just, I have a soft spot in my heart for him. So from the point of view of humanities, which wanders around in a lot of different disciplines, literature, the arts and film and plays and all kinds of stuff, my first thought was, well, Holmes through time in film. And that turned out to be an exhaustive process because there's a lot more versions of Holmes uh, than probably most people in the room know. Everybody knows the Basil Rathbone one, the Jeremy Brett one, and the more recent ones um, with Robert uh, Downey and um, what's Jude the Law. lovely Jude young, Jude Law. Jude Law. right, yeah. Jude Law, and, uh, and the, the lovely young man who's playing uh, <laughs> Assange in the film, uh, Cumberbatch, is that his name? Yeah. Benedict, yeah, sure. right. So you really can see, if, I mean, it would be fun to look at, and there's also much earlier ones that nobody knows about that were made on, on <clears throat> film sets at Shepperton by the BBC and had uh, a very obscure actors that you've probably never heard of in them, and black and white kinescope films. And I thought it would be fun to look at these characters over time, but I realized I could take a whole hour and a half to do that, and that wasn't really... Fair. So I tried. I thought maybe you would enjoy seeing Doyle himself, and seeing how close he is in character to the Watson character. I mean, the way he speaks and all of that affect and stuff. Certainly in the earlier versions. In the some of the earlier versions, the ones that you don't ordinarily see, he's much more of a buffoon, a real fool. And I think over time, you can see the character has changed and advanced. Um, to be much more of a partner to Holmes and equal to Holmes rather than some kind of subservient creature that came from the war in Afghanistan and doesn't know how to tie his shoes, which often seems that way, the way that Sherlock, uh, Sherlock speaks to him. So that was what I thought about and ended up with these things that were on YouTube. I just want to add that the students who are looking to explore Sherlock Holmes in relationship to some of these other subjects. Um, there is a superb library guide that was set up by in our library by um, Smith uh, uh, Avanti, who's um, the English liaison, and she.
she has, I think she has the science book on there, but she definitely has stuff about Sherlock Holmes's way of thinking, lots of clips for film. So anybody who wants to keep exploring what's been discussed here today, I think that's a really great place for um, people to go. It's at, if you go to the SRJC library, so santarosa.edu slash library, you click on the icon for Wolm, and you'll, it'll come up with the um, link to the library guide. It's an excellent, excellent library guide, and has materials both available online and things that aren't on the library anymore. Plus, it's hard not to love those Edwardian costumes, you know? <laughs> Are you asking if he ever jumps to conclusions? <laughs> well, I just think that, I don't know. But what strikes me sometimes is, you know, it's like pulling a rabbit out of the hat sometimes. Like yeah. He just happens to know some obscure detail. And that's the thing that, you know, where the suspension of beliefs kind of challenge sometimes. Uh, but, you know, you, I just kind of think of it as good fun. It's, it's, you know, it's the sort of thing, it's a character that has this ability that, that you know, it's almost like a type of intellectual superhero, if you will. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, he's got, he's got these abilities. That, you know, maybe there's no human that really has them to that degree. But I would say that these are skills that we all have, mm -hmm. and, and he's kind of an archetype that, you know, we can aspire to be more and more like. That's the way I would say it. Well, and I also think that there are areas in which he's lacking, and, and you know, I think this is how he makes up for those other things. And I, did, I don't have the actual book with me, but Dr. Watson right away makes a list of all the things that Sherlock Holmes doesn't know about. <laughs> and so this is almost like his hyper-focus, is, is I'm going to think about why this is here. And it reminded me of this movie that I saw called The Zero Effect. I don't know how many of you have seen that movie. It's with... Um, his name is Bill Pullman. It's an amazing movie, and it's a modern day Sherlock Holmes. And basically, he can look at someone and be like, oh, you work as an EMT. And you know, he just knows all this stuff. But he has terrible social skills. And he, you know, his apartment's a mess, and he stands on the counter and plays his guitar. I mean, it's exactly like Sherlock Holmes with his violin. And he's, he's a little bit off. And so I sort of chalked it up to, that's what he's really good at. And he's kind of not so good at other things. Yeah, if you notice in many, <clears throat> one of the films we looked parts we looked at, he was antsy because he didn't have a case. He doesn't seem to be himself if he doesn't have something particular to put that focus on. And, and, and very much in many of the stories and lots of the film versions really lacks social skills in dealing with women in particular. Yeah, there's some dis <clears throat> there's some discussions. <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> with Mycroft, his brother, about what he was like. But there is a certain it's um, a lot of it is obscure, and you don't really you don't get a, if you're looking for a full picture. Well, they did this and they did this, and I, I I've never seen anything like that. But Mycroft indicates that he was always rather strange. He's person. always worried about him. Yes, yes. exactly. No. You're not sure why. <laughs> We wonder if maybe he met Moriarty earlier in his life and something happened there, and that might have had something to do with it, you know, his nemesis. Yeah. Um, the, well, as much as he seems to be like anti social, or not anti, kind of social problems, uh, does that do, seems that like, you know, intelligence and like someone who's smart is normally like socially awkward and someone who's like social is kind of, you know, right. dim. Is right. that usually like kind of just the theme in most books or just caused by just generally in, focusing on In the Sherlock Holmes books or? In Sherlock, you're talking about Sherlock? Yeah. I think he's oblivious. 
to a lot of things that most people uh, think are important, and I think it's a commentary on the society that they're talking about. I mean, yeah, as, as a philosophy teacher, it kind of strikes me often you'll get characters that have great intellectual skills, and and I, I often I look to see how they're portrayed. Are they you know are they emotionally you know just kind of immature, or underdeveloped, problematic, you know, they, they, they spock, you know, they, they you, you often, you know, it's often it's portrayed in kind of this dualistic way, you're either one or the other. It's a problem I actually deal with in my classes. Sometimes students will kind of say I'm one type of person and not another type. Uh, and it's something you sometimes have to try to get people to overcome. You are capable of this. And yeah, it seems like in our literature as you see that sometimes it's, and at the same time, it seems natural to me if there's one skill that you really, really develop, you, you, and it, it makes sense to me that you likely aren't going to be as developed in other stuff. You know, there's just the time factor of nothing else. So you don't want to be too careful to, you know, to overgeneralize. But it's probably a risk we all, we all, you know, face if we focus on just playing piano all day. We're kind of depriving ourselves of other things. We are talking about the Edwardian period in England, which was, you know, Britain is extremely, <clears throat> very strong social consciousness, social class, certain ways of behavior, don't cross those lines and that kind of stuff. And I'm, I, I see that in the, the milieu of the stories when you look at sort of the outside edges of them. His mm -hmm. housekeeper, for instance, Mrs. Hudson, she's portrayed differently in these films. And some of the later ones, she's, I don't know, it seems like he hates her. In the earlier ones, it seems like he really loves her. So I, th you know, I think it depends on who's directing and who's writing the script too. But it is important to remember these are English stories, British stories in this period where things were pretty rigid socially. And he's to some degree oblivious to it. I think so. I think, yeah. I don't think he's mean-spirited. I think he just doesn't get it. He doesn't see certain kinds of things. And he doesn't have to because he's Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Come one follow, one may may or may not follow the other. You know, it was legal then. So, you know, that's that that has something to do with it. You know, does the drug make the addict, or does the addict find the drug? Is that what you're asking? Basically, what, what your thoughts are. I, mean, I was just thinking of maybe it was just just because it never really drove him down like it does so many people now. Well, because he he was very careful about how much he used for one thing. That you know he was, the seven percent solution was really the solution that he was using. So, um, and a lot of people used cocaine, and other drugs that are now illegal. Then they weren't illegal. Like, uh, oh yeah. Freud. Yeah. Well, I want to thank again our panelists for being here. So, thank you very much. And now you're done with Sherlock? Yes. And oh, yeah. Good night. <laughs> Thank you for coming again. They're on their way. Oh, I love Sherlock.